A Clockwork Orange is a film created in 1971 by the director Stanley Kubrick, which follows the plot of the novel under the same title, written by Anthony Burgess. The story revolves around a maleficent boy named Alex DeLarge, leader of a violent gang of boys named Dim, Georgie, and Pete, all of which speak a fictionalized language made by Anthony Burgess himself, known as Natsat. The boys later revolt against him and his leadership for a more democratic approach. Once they realize that Alex is uncontainable and will do anything to be the leader of their gang, they sabotage him and have him arrested. Once in prison, Alex is selected for the new technique for rehabilitation called the Ludovico's Technique, which Alex desperately desires to be a part of. Not for the sake of rehabilitation, but for the drastic decrease in his 14-year prison sentence, which will be reduced to two weeks. Despite the constant suggestions to not proceed with the technique by the prison pastor, Alex joins regardlessly. The Little Vigo's technique involves injecting the patient with an experimental serum, that of which causes the patient to feel terribly ill and nauseous. During this exposure period, the patient is forced to watch a series of violent films, so that the patient's body will associate violence with feeling ill and nauseous. After an unbearable two weeks, Alex was released a reformed man without the ability to perform violent acts that he had used to. However, he finds that without this ability, he is completely defenseless, as he falls ill when his previous victims begin enacting their revenge. He even re-encounters his old enemy Billy Boy and his old friend Dim, now police officers getting their revenge also, in which they beat him up and leave him in fields far from his home. Needing help, he knocks on the nearest house seeking refuge, and he's welcomed by a familiar writer and political dissident. This familiarity is due to the fact that Alex once broke into his house with his old gang, where they beat him up and raped his wife, who died due to the shock that followed this incident. However, due to the masks they wore, the writer Frederick Alexander didn't recognize him and only saw an opportunity to attack the government. Looking for ways to blame the government for Alex's brainwashing, he begins interrogating Alex, who reveals that not only can he not see or think violence, but he cannot listen to his favorite artist, Ludwig van Beethoven, and his Ninth Symphony without feeling the same nauseousness. During the interview, Alex speaks his old slang, Nadsat, a combination of Russian slang and childlike English, which Frederick recognizes, and he grows suspicious of Alex over the murder of his wife. After this, Frederick and his team bring Alex to an apartment and lock him inside while blasting the Ninth Symphony in an attempt to have Alex commit suicide. He does make an attempt by throwing himself outside the apartment window, however the fall doesn't kill him. When he awakes in the hospital, Alex finds that the Ludovico's technique has been undid, restoring Alex's old self. This is done by state doctors for the purpose of having Alex endorse the government rather than rebel against them. The scene that I chose follows the events before Alex's arrest, where the gang disband Alex as their leader for a more democratic approach. The gang elects Georgie as the leader so that he is to represent all of the gang and what they want. Alex appears to agree with this newborn leadership until they walk on the flat block marina and Alex hears opera music from a nearby open window, which inspires him to beat up his gang. He does so, successfully whacking both Georgie and Dim multiple times and slashing Dim's hand, all while Pete retreats in fear. Without further hesitation, here's the clip. I've taught you much, my little droogies. Now tell me what you had in mind, Georgie boy. Oh, the old Malocco Plus first, would Malocco you not Plus, say? Eh? <laughs> He's coming Some to sharpen us up. Some of the Malocco Plus. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. you especially, we have the start. Yeah, you yeah. guys have the bird, because we've got start on you. <laughs> yeah, Malocco Plus, eh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As we walked along the flat block marina, I was calm on the outside, but thinking all the time. So now it was to be Georgie the General, saying what we should do and what not to do, and dim as his mindless, grinning bulldog. But suddenly I vidded that thinking was for the gloopy ones, and that the omni ones use like inspiration and what bog sends. For now it was lovely music that came to my aid. There was a window open with a stereo on, and I vidded right at once what to do.
I chose this scene for its significance to the storyline and its overall ability to capture the many themes in the film and display well used of psychoanalytic literary theory. It plays a crucial role in the storyline as this scene represents the turning point in the relationship of Alex and his Druze and foreshadows the sabotage they plan on Alex. Overall in this scene there are no crucial plotline differences with the exception that instead of Alex beating Georgie, they both pull the razor blades on each other. Dim still fails to assist Georgie, and Pete stays off to the side in, the, in fear like in the film. Unlike Burgess's novel, Kubrick uses his directorial liberties to have this scene have a comedic tone by the usage of classical dramatic music, slow motion video, and overemphasized actions performed by the characters, which makes for an overall laughable scene. This improves the scene because it makes the scene much more bearable to watch such violence and improves the flow of the story whereas if the tone matched the novels, it would be much more gruesome and difficult to watch, losing the interest of the viewers early on in the film. This scene also displays Alex's true intentions. Once the leadership role is stripped from him, Alex sees his id take over himself once he's influenced by the music heard in the scene. This brings out Alex's shadow, the side of himself he would rather not confront, and he enacts with rage and utilizes his love of ultraviolence in the harming of his peers effectively beating Dim and Georgie and slashing Dim's hand. The casting choice for the film also improves the scene heavily due to the excellent casting done by Kubrick, as the actors all fit their roles perfectly, effectively capturing the full character in each of their performances. Alex, played by Malcolm McDowell, was an excellent casting for this role. McDowell played a strong interpretation of Alex, including a strong voice, likable personality, and he overall fit the role perfectly. Alex being played by a strong actor is important because the viewer needs to like the main character of the story, so they are pulled in and enjoy the film as a whole much more. Warren Clark was casted for the role of Dim. He was a great fit for the role of Dim, and Kubrick effectively chose Clark as he displayed all of the qualities of Dim. With him being big and muscular compared to the others, he had a wide and innocent smile, and he resembled a stereotypical moronic football jock. When he speaks, he continuously rambles on and on, matches, matching Burgess's character in his novel. Georgie was played by the gentleman named James Marcus. This was, an effect, this was effective, as he seemed as though he could have been an effective leader, but this leadership role seemed to fit Alex more. He overall had a secondary feeling to his personality, which was what made his cast so effective on film. Lastly, Michael Tarn played Pete, who was the most altered in Kubrick's adaptation from Burgess's. Pete's character was very quiet and innocent, which Tarn played effectively. However, his character as a whole compared to Burgess's in his novel was somewhat of a downgrade. In the film, Pete doesn't say a single word, whereas he has few but some lines in the novel. This makes his character in the film seem tremendously irrelevant in the story, and he could play a much bigger role given some lines in the script. The costume choice Kubrick dressed his characters in was a fully white outfit with exceptions to a black hat and black boots, and they wore a codpiece. This drastically contrasts the outfits that Burgess dresses the characters in his film, where they wear black tights with waistcoats, shoulder pads, and white cravats. The black boots are the only aspect of the outfit that made it from the novel to the film. This decision made by director Kubrick is effective as they accurately display his choice of tone for the film. The fully white outfits and cod pieces look somewhat comedic and effectively assist lightening the tone of the novel's grim and somewhat serious tone to one that is more comedic and goofy. These white outfits also display the characters' mindsets in the story, as they don't care how ridiculous they look because they are feared just as much. This scene features a classical soundtrack in the background of the overly dramatic fight scene. The specific song choice truly helps improve the scene as this classical song is normally used in scenes where there is fighting present and a lot of cin cinematics involved, as the song usually is the only sound heard and is played over the dramatic actions of the characters, resulting in a far more dramatic scene. This also enhances the comedic effect when paired with the slow motion filming, as it makes the characters' actions seem less theatrical and more comical. The setting of this scene takes place at the Flat Block Marina. Kubrick proves this location to be a sufficient setting as it ties together all of Kubrick's directorial liberties and fits well with the tone of his scene. The water which Dim and Georgie fall into acts for a more dramatic fall with the slow motion splashes, and the daytime light mirrors the light tone that Kubrick wishes to establish. It also has a lot of open space for the characters to utilize, like Alex does by seizing the opportunity to attack Georgie by surprise. <laughs> 